Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. You're watching West Hartford Community Television. For the community, by the community. Good day. I am H. Robert Silverstein, MD, for the Preventive Medicine Center and West Hartford Cable Access TV. If you have any questions about this show, please contact us online at the www.thepmc.org or just Google my name, H. Robert Silverstein, MD. You will find a link uh, to that website, and then you can ask questions or make comments uh, that we will respond to in all probability. Uh, some things I might not respond to. Okay, recently we had a big snow, and so this poem was penned. Let's see here. Here we go. Twas late looking out to the foot-thick snow, the light so strong even with no moon, surprised that it could be so bright, somehow reminded me that this life would end and sights like this not seen again, there are times when life is lonely and times felt, filled with others felt so strongly. The connection feels so virile in that moment. The being alone, not loneliness, just there and not an emptiness. Okay, thank you for the applause. Thank you, thank you. Okay, now, uh, let's see. Uh, today's program I'm going to have for the most part, hopefully, on my uh, cell phone, which is uh, a Samsung Note 5. By the way, I went to the Apple store the other day and was just amazed. Uh, I had been sent an Apple iPad Air 2, and so I wanted to get a case for it, and so I bought one of those combination cases and keyboards. Just uh, incidentally, I went to Louis Vuitton. They had something for it for $550. I ended up spending $100 at Apple because uh, I, bought the one with, I bought the case with the keyboard. But uh, gee, that was pretty interesting, exciting, and so on. Louis Vuitton has some great design stuff. Okay, now let's see. Breaking news. Let's see what's breaking news. Okay, uh, that's not of any interest. Um, all right, now, uh, first of all, uh, this is what I had for lunch today. This is vegetable medley soup from Whole Foods, it's their 365 uh, brand. It was organic uh, and frankly, very tasty. And uh, as you can tell, it's vegetable stew, it's not beef stew. Next, I wanna talk about, oh, why, do I, why did I have vegetable stew for lunch? The human body, whether we like it or not, is, is essentially, not absolutely, about 90 plus percent vegan by design. So the eggs in the morning and the tuna sandwich at lunch and the chicken breast for dinner is all wrong. Uh, no, actually, I shouldn't say that. It's all right if you want to keep me in business. Recall, I'm a cardiologist. And it's also good for keeping the oncologists, the cancer doctors, in business. The reason we have so much heart disease, diabetes, and cancer is because we make it happen. We are not unfortunate victims. And that should be remembered. Almost everything that happens in our life is what we do, is a result of what we do to ourselves or don't do for ourselves. So uh, uh, our teeth are flat and grinding like all the herbivore animals. 
Uh, we don't have fangs and claws. We can't digest rotten meat uh, like all carnivores can. We have a small bowel length that is the same for all other herbivores. When you measure uh, the ratio from nose to where our tail would be, uh, and it goes so on and so on. So again, it's not that you have to do anything. You don't have to avoid cocaine. You don't have to avoid heroin. You don't have to avoid cigarettes, alcohol, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But it's sort of like, and I've told this story here before, when, when I was growing up in my hometown in Bell Fountain, Ohio, there was a church. And the church had this great big neon cross on the bell tower. And I was so, always so amazed that it would have an outlined cross in neon. I thought that was so incongruous for a church, but, you know, that's what it had. But on that cross, it said, get right with God. And, and obviously, that's stuck in my mind for forever. And what I'm talking about, God or any other explanation you want to have, there is a right intake for this human biology. What are we supposed to weigh? What are we supposed to eat? What are we supposed to exercise? And believe you me, if you're interested in weight loss, exercise is the smallest part of that. People always talk to me about uh, how they're doing with their exercise when 70% of weight loss is due to diet alone. All right, enough of that point. Let's go on. Now, Recently, I've begun to run into a problem from insurance companies that won't let me prescribe the medication Zetia, Z-E-T-I-A, also called azitamibe. Yeah, uh, azitamibe, azitamibe. I couldn't remember whether it had a B or a D in it. Um, and uh, what it does is it's a good add-on when you have to use medication. Remember, I just said high blood pressure, high cholesterol, diabetes, 95% curable. I'm going to come to an article about uh, type 2 diabetes in children. They put them on a very low calorie diet. They lost weight. The diabetes went away. I've been saying that for 30 years or more. Diabetes is curable at the 95% level. People are diabetic. I don't mean to sound hostile, but that's the way it's going to sound. People are diabetic because they want to be. That's 95% true. There are the true insulin-dependent diabetics who are thin that depend upon insulin for their life saving. But almost everyone who is overweight is diabetic because of what they weigh. And all you have to do is change what they eat and the diabetes and the high blood pressure and the high cholesterol and the high triglycerides all go away down to normal, down to what we in our culture called, call very low normal, which is, so to speak, absolutely protective for develop, from developing the kidney disease, uh, heart attack, needing an angioplasty, open heart surgery, and so on and so on. So anyhow, so the insurance companies are giving me a hard time now about this drug which is very effective at lowering cholesterol and lowering the adverse uh, contents of these cholesterol plaques that build up in the blood vessels that end up causing stroke or heart attack or needing an angioplasty or open heart surgery. And um, that's, uh, that's, that's interference. By the way, I wanna talk about why people are objecting so much in my best guess to what's going on in Washington and politics in general. And it has to do with the fact that for eight years we have been taught one way and now we are, here's the key word, uncertain about which direction things are going now. It's very early in the new administration uh, to draw too many conclusions, whether you like, you don't like, uh, that's your individual choice. But it's the uncertainty that has people off balance. All right, going on. Coffee and bladder cancer. I, I, I read this article about coffee and bladder cancer, and after I read it, I had to call in my super smart secretary and say, will you help me read this and interpret it? And what it basically said was, there was no relationship between coffee intake and the development of bladder cancer. 
And when you looked at it, it was very clear that if you didn't drink coffee at all, you had the lowest incidence of cancer of the bladder. Now, just today I sent a friend uh, an article, and there have been a number of articles, and I'll give you the references now. One is uh, A. B. Hill in the Proceedings of the Royal Society of Medicine in 1965, and he wrote about the errors in medical articles, statistical errors, and what's wrong with medical studies that uh, uh, make them unreliable. Recently, two guys by the name of Pocock, who is in England, and Stone, who uh, is here in the United States, wrote a summary article also in the New England Journal of Medicine, and I think that was in September of 2016. And they talked about when the primary result fails, or that's sort of the title, not exactly, when the primary result fails or is negative, and then what are you supposed to do? And the answer is, well, what are you supposed to do when it's negative? What are you supposed to do when it's positive? And they point out the same kinds of things that were in the 1965 article of A.B. Hill. Now, it's not like they didn't add anything new. You've got to have a refresher course every now and then. And their article was beautifully written with examples and so on. Uh, but basically, what it says is a great deal of the medical literature is very unreliable. And remember, why am I talking about this now? Because I just talked about a coffee article that had the basic conclusion wrong. It showed that cancer of the bladder was lowest in those people who did not drink coffee, and yet its conclusion was coffee was unrelated to the development of cancer of the bladder. Now, to be perfectly fair, not that this is a legitimate criticism, but uh, I'm never co comfortable when an article comes out of Japan, China, or Korea just because their lifestyle is so different from our lifestyle here. So what I'm really saying is, not that the scientists don't know how to do a study, I'm saying the population behaves so differently from what we do here in the United States, I'm not sure we're comparing apples and oranges, but in any case, I've always thought that coffee caused cancer of the bladder. Enough of that. Going on. How am I doing, ladies? Great, great. Great, oh, well, fine. Jackie and Emma are on camera today and they say I'm doing great. Uh, let's see here. Ah, Leo Tolstoy. Tolstoy wrote that as a young man, what guided his life apart from animal instincts, instincts was faith in self-perfection. This legitimate desire to improve him, himself for him quickly changed into an obsession not to be better in his own eyes or even the eyes of God, but in the eyes of others. There's a time and a place to be aware of what others are thinking, and there is a time and a place not to be a member of the crowd, but to be independent and think for yourself. And I'm not bragging, but I'm gonna brag. Uh, I'm not bragging, really. But when I talked about the interpretation of that article about bladder cancer and coffee, you know, I don't care what the authors of that article said. Here's what it said to me. And now the same kind of thing. And you may say, well, that's kind of a weak comparison, and it is. But the point is, We've lost our confidence in being able to be individuals. Yes, each one of us goes to school and we study what we're interested in, but we've become much more group thinkers than individual thinkers. And I think that's a bad idea. As Tolstoy put it, and very soon this desire, let's see here. Very soon, this desire to be better in the eyes of other people was replaced by a desire to be more powerful than other people is, more fame than other people, uh, more famous, more important, richer than others. So it does get to be competitive. And of course, the United States was built by the Puritans who came over here and had nothing. They made everything they had. And then we had the pioneers who went to other states and kept moving west. All of that is about self-reliance. And there are plenty of poems and books entitled Self-Reliance. And again, it's not that you shouldn't be a member of a group. It's just that you ought to be able to be capable of thinking for yourself. Thinking for yourself. 
And that goes back to that concept of uncertainty. The public now feels uncertain. All right, let's see if we can get back. Desire to be better in the eyes of other people and then also to compare yourself to the competition. It's not a bad idea to have a sense of perspective, but it's important to be who you are. Um, <laughs> I have a friend, his name is J.T. Guy, M.D. Um, and he, he, the, when I grew up in Ohio, there were two grade schools. I went to Hubbard and he went to Central. And so I was king of the mountain at Hubbard after my third grade teacher told me I wasn't stupid and I ought to be getting better grades. Uh, and so from then on, I never got a B. But then I went to the seventh grade where I met J.T. Guy. And I'm telling you, it was shocking and depressing how much smarter he was than I was. And frankly, I never got over it. Uh, he is, he's just so smart about everything. Now, I can't think any better than I do. Uh, and he couldn't do this show. It's not his nature to do this kind of a thing. Uh, you know the Run DMC group? You got a big, big, big mouth? That's me. So, but anyhow, um, it, it was when I compare myself to him, which was inevitable, because we were in all these classes together, and then we'd get together every vacation uh, during college, and then we lived together my freshman year, and uh, we lived, studied together my sophomore year, and then we went our separate directions when we took different rotations throughout the hospital, whether it was orthopedics or gynecology or internal medicine or kidney disease, whatever it was, we were on different tracks at that point. He ended up graduating. He graduated second in the class only because uh, he didn't go to a Saturday morning history of medicine class as often as he needed to to get an A, but he was almost a straight A student. Curiously, I got an A in surgery and he didn't. Uh, he got a B in surgery uh, from one of the world's greatest surgeons that was at Ohio State where we went to school together. Uh, <clears throat> anyhow, uh, Here's the one about the vegetarian diet for kids. Uh, oh, no. This one says a vegetarian diet reduces hardening of the arteries in the neck. And, uh, of course, what it does, it allows the body to heal. We, I told you before, we make diseases occur. If you quit making them occur, they can start to go away. Could such be true about cancer? I think yes to a point, and yes could be true to a point about diabetes and hardening of the arteries, but uh, cancer is a little bit tougher nut to crack, and so I'm not entirely certain that diet alone could cause regression of cancer. I have seen it, but I'm not going to take the position uh, that um, uh, the diet was entirely responsible or that vast numbers of people could have their cancer outlook. No, I am going to take that position. Everybody's outlook with cancer almost certainly would be better if they were almost completely vegan. And again, I'm not completely vegan. I'm not throwing a stone. I'm here to educate. Very much invitation to consider. Very much take it or leave it is the tough way to say it. Uh, I give you this information. You think about it. You're in charge of you. I'm in charge of me. You're in charge of you. And then do with it what you will. And if you have questions, then like I said, Google my name, H. Robert Silverstein, MD, and you'll find a link to the website. And then you can send us emails there. Or you can call us at the phone number 860-549-3444. All right. Going on, going on. Uh, oops. Here's an article about animal versus vegetable protein. A comparison of the effects of diets high in animal or plant protein, and it basically says there isn't much difference, and then the same thing. They give all these improvements that happened on the vegetarian diet that did not happen on the animal protein diet. Uh, you may say, well, how, what? What'd you say, 10 minutes? Okay. Uh, it takes, it, takes, it takes judgment. And you see, judgment is hard to come by. Uh, judgment is 
I don't think it's trained as much now as it used to be. Now we rely on protocols so much more than we used to. If you have this, and it's not exactly cookbook, but it's in that direction. There's always a level of individual judgment, but I, I think uh, when it comes to medical judgment, it's just not being stressed as much as it used to be. Uh, I want to change gears for a couple of minutes, go through stacks of papers. I ordered an ultrasound on a person when I was looking for an adrenal tumor because blood pressure and potassium were off. The patient was basically vegan and his potassium was lower normal. Well, it turns out from experience, uh, and that's one of the things I like to put forth, you do learn something from experience, and I've had at least 200,000 patient visits in the time that I've been practicing. Now, when do I start counting practicing? Uh, I started on the wards uh, in my junior year in medical school. So what that does, if I count, if I count that, because it is a kind of practicing, um, uh, and go up through my internship, residency, fellowship, military, came here to Hartford, uh, that's uh, 53 years of experience. Now, people don't always learn from their experience. I know some very bright people who have had excellent experience and they're doing crazy things. Of course, some people would say that about me, but you know that's not true because I tell the truth here on this program. Anyhow, uh, so I ordered this abdominal ultrasound on a fellow who had a potassium about 3.8, and you see he's nearly vegan, so his potassium, and not many people know this, a vegan diet is very high in potassium and magnesium. So they should not have low magnesium and they should not have low potassium. His, his potassium was 3.8. That's considered in the normal range. That's not normal for someone who's vegan. Vegan is 4.1 to 4.4. Now, has that ever been written up? No, that's never been written up. But that's what I have learned from my experience of taking care of vegan patients and so on and so on. So, um... So I suspected that he was having this irregular heartbeat and he was having a little bit of high blood pressure and was feeling weird. So I thought maybe there's an adrenal tumor. I order this abdominal ultrasound and what pops up? An adrenal tumor. Um, that was really kind of interesting. And uh, yes, uh, I'm such a great doctor and such an excellent diagnostician. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I also got lucky. There's a saying, well, I'm from Ohio, and there, let's say, I'll just say it almost the way we say it in Ohio. Even a blind pig can find a breast once in a while. And what that is talking about is newborn baby pigs who can't see anything because they're just newborn. Somehow they manage to snuggle up to their mother and find the breast and start feeding. So it's a discussion of being lucky is what I'm saying. Maybe I was lucky. Now, going, uh, did I talk about uh, electronic medical records? I have a hissy fit about electronic medical records. Here's an article on residents spend more time on computer than with patients. That's absolutely true. Medicine has been destroyed by those people at Medicare and Medicaid and the insurance companies who forced computers on us. Now, I wouldn't mind if they forced computers on us and then uh, gave us the support, whether it's uh, they paid for extra office staff or they paid salary differences. I spend hours preparing the charts before I see the patients. Now, I don't mean hours on each one. I mean, I spend about an hour a day preparing the charts for the next day's practice. And uh, let's see, today is Monday and I get started up tomorrow. I've already gone in over Saturday and I went to the office and I got out the list of patients and I prepared the chart so they'd be in proper shape and I had to check off the summary sheet to see that I didn't have too many diagnoses in the diagnosis list or that in the, uh, the old diagnoses there weren't too many that were. This dry, it doesn't drive me crazy. It's just that it's absurd that there's so much demand that makes an article like this true. What'd you say, five minutes? Okay. You got six fingers on that hand or five? Uh, it looked like six for a second. <laughs> All right, so uh, the point being is that, and then I, this was uh, uh, 
let's see, what do you call it? Sort of a blog, a medical blog. It's a very good educational blog, and then people can comment on it. And I've already said I'm a big, big, big mouth, uh, so I comment a lot on these things. And um, oh, so here's what I wrote. Either I don't know how to practice after 53 years, 200,000 patient visits, or this is nonsense. If you really take care of patients, each adult office visit is different and all patients are handmade one of a kind. What are they eating? Are they losing weight? Why? Why not? How are things at home? Who is stressing them and why? I do not use templates, but do drag and dictate enough. Uh, the absolute stupidity of the electronic medical record is that national interconnectivity was not established before any electronic medical record was released onto the market. This, maximum, th this was maximum stupidity. Since it's being forced on us, the demand should have been continue to be reimbursed for all extra work, which is enormous. That means a lot higher re reimbursement than is currently happening. And I've already said, give us a, a staff the support. I don't care. Don't pay me. Pay somebody else to come in and do what we used to call in med school the scut work. Enough of that. All right. Um, here's an article about anticoagulation when you have knee replacement or hip replacement surgery. And they give you a little cookbook cookbook list of things to pay attention to. And I sort of thought that the, that was a reasonable updating. We are literally overwhelmed with these guidelines, uh, which some of which are helpful and others are a drag. Now, a lot of women have trouble controlling peeing, uh, particularly after childbirth. And um, one of the thought processes that I read just today was that if women get put on Cialis, that's uh, the helpful, one of the helpful medications like Viagra for men who are experiencing a little difficulty with ED, uh, that it helped women with what's called urge incontinence. In other words, uh, they get the urge to go and they just have to get there or they're gonna pee a little bit in their pants. And I thought that that was uh, a very interesting idea. Uh, I also think that that's a good idea to put people on before open heart surgery because it has to do with nitric oxide production. All right, getting back. Well, let's see what this one's about. This is one of these medical educational articles Real world of safety antiviral, okay. This one is about treating hepatitis. Oh, huh. Here's men who have a question, two minutes. Men who have an enlarged prostate and there is a suspicion, perhaps by the blood test. And by the way, there are a bunch more blood tests for men about prostate cancer. Uh, everybody hangs their hat on uh, the PSA, the total and the free, but there's also PCA3, T2ERG, four calocrines, and a couple of others. But what they're saying here is that when men get biopsied, there is a, a, they go up the rear end and then through uh, and take up needles, needle cores of the biopsy of the prostate and uh, some men get really sick with infections and they're discussing the antibiotics to take before that, uh, which is an interesting idea. All right. Uh, all right, I don't, I'm not so much into infectious disease. Let's see if I can find something else out here. Here's one about high blood pressure. Let's see what they've got to say. association between a walk test and fitness in people with high blood pressure. Okay. Uh, effects of metabolites of dietary sodium. Oh, wrap it up. Okay, that's it. Good day and God bless you all. Hope you enjoyed the program. I am H. Robert Silverstein, MD, for the Preventive Medicine Center.